Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another Real Estate Podcast. My name is Kevin Thatcher, the founder and CEO. That's right, Chief Everything Officer here at Independence Title, back with another fantastic interview. If you're listening to this on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, just give us a like, share, follow, uh, so we can bring more content to those viewers out there. Today, we have Britt Fauché. He is a real estate investor, an entrepreneur, but more importantly, his core values are what I wanted to start with. So, so Britt, thanks for joining us today on the show. Yeah, Kevin, so glad to be on with you, man. Can't wait to, to share with your audience. Awesome. So your, your three core values, three Fs, faith, family, freedom. So let's start with faith. You know, we love to educate viewers because we never know who's listening and, and when they just need a little hand up as opposed to a handout. So tell me a little bit about these core values. Yeah, so starts with faith. You know, the, the reality is we all believe in something. And so uh, for me, that that is in Jesus, I, I have just found that I, I've always needed something to fall back on. And um, when times uh, were scary, when they were tough, when I didn't know where to turn, um, that for me, my faith has been foundational. I needed so, kind of something to just be the foundation of everything I do. And for me, um, faith has been that. And when I've tried to do life without it, it feels like something is, is, is missing. There's a hole. And, uh, and I trust me, I've tried. I've tried to do it without it. And so faith for me is super important. Um, yeah, and if you want me to keep going, I can keep going. Family, um, you know, I, I just, family for me is my most important thing. Um, I, I've really um, started building the life that I have for my family. When I was 21, 22, 23, I was thinking, I want to grind hard and grind now. I, I didn't, hadn't even met my wife yet. I didn't have any children because in, in the future, I wanted to be able to spend time and not have to be married to a nine to five, but actually be married to my wife and not have to like parent a job, but actually be able to parent my children. And, and so to me, they're everything. Um, you know, I look at my children and I realize I've only got 18 years with a man. It's, a, it's a, not a lot, a lot of time. And I got a five and a three-year-old now. So I'm down to 13 years with my oldest. And so that time is fleeting. And for me, um, I, my job works for me. I don't work for my job. And, and so in doing that, I've created the ability to just create a lot of time and space for my family. Um, super important. And then finance, man. Um, you know, I don't know how you can go through this life without fin finances being important. Um, and so, um, I, and I just see so many people struggle with finance. So many people get so many financial things wrong. And so I'm just super passionate about helping people get their finances right, whatever that might look like. And not everyone needs to be Grant Cardone. You know, not everyone needs to be Robert Kiyosaki or um, Dave Ramsey. I mean, you could just be you and just get your finances right and uh, alleviate a lot of stress and tension and things like that. So I'm a big believer in getting your finances right. Get those th three things right, faith, family, finance. Um, and I think you'll go a long way. So I think it's great. Yeah, I just actually just launched my uh, ninth book called Superhero Dad, which talks about, you know, just things that that I'm, I'm in a lot of masterminds and some are uh, just men and dad only mastermind. So we put a little book together about just some of the strategies that help you become a better man, a better father, a be, you know, just, just an overall better person. And we do a lot of speaking and I follow all the guys you're talking about, but like you said, you have to be you. My, my goal is not to be somebody else. My goal is mm -hmm. to be with my values, my faith, my family. And, and I love the freedom, right? Financial freedom is, is what everyone wants to look for. The problem is a lot of people, you know, they, they get these courses and, and, you know, they read these books and it's like they never put any action into it. And, you know, by reading through your bio, we see that that you've put action into it. So you have multiple businesses, a seven figure landscaping company, a flipping company, a rental portfolio. So talk a little bit like, like where you started and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I you know, started really with nothing and I made up my mind really early on. I, I wasn't really too interested in being rich. I just was interested in not being poor. And so I just wanted to be able to go through life without having to stress out about money. And that was really my motivation early on. My motivation is different today than it was when I was 21 and didn't know a lot of things. But back then, that's what drove me. And so, you know, I, I just saw real estate for me as a path to that. And I just really liked houses. 
I don't know. There was something about them. I liked going in them. I, I just remember walking into houses and kind of like feeling like, man, this house is a story. I mean, people have lived here and, you know, raised their families here. And so I just I liked that. I liked the architecture. I liked the landscaping. And so something just drew me to real estate and bought my first property when I was 23. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Like zero clue, Kevin. And uh, at the time, the market was awful. Everyone was telling me, don't buy real estate probably should have listened, but I didn't. And I actually was fortunate to not have listened. I mean, this was back in like 09. And at the time, the government was running a, a tax buyer credit. That's how bad things were, is they were saying, we'll give you $8,000 to buy a house. And so uh, I had $8,000. And I used that money as the down payment to get into the house, got an FHA loan, three and a half percent down It was a beautiful thing. And um, I got that check in the mail. So again, now I don't have any money, but I got the, the $8,000 credit in the mail. I took that $8,000 and, and somehow turned $8,000 into a flip. I, don't, I still don't know how I did that. I was hustling, buying stuff off of Craigslist. I mean, there was Facebook Marketplace wasn't really a thing back then. Um, buying like used tile. And I mean, I was just scraping by and uh, man, sold that property. Uh, two years to the day. That's one thing I did know. I, was, I knew that if I could sell it and live in it for two years, that I could get tax-free gains. And so um, I remember getting a check, I think it was for like $40,000. And I just thought I was like rich, man. I thought I had like, I had done it. I had reached financial freedom. Um, <laughs> and then like life kicked in, right? And so, um, and I also was driven enough to just keep going. So took that money, started rolling it into the next deal. And into the next deal. Before I know it, I had guys actually going like, hey, what do you do? And I remember a lunch on a Sunday one day, a guy said, hey, man, if you ever need capital, you know, for what you're doing, let me know. And I was probably only 24, 25. And like, I was just like, wait, what is you, you want to give me money? And so uh, literally the next day, I wrote this guy an email, he became one of my first investors, just started buying more and more real estate. And um, yeah, so, you know, fast forward a few years, about five years later, I start dating someone and, you know, I get married and I just realized that the life of a real estate investor is a, is a very sort of up and down kind of roller coaster of an experience. And what I mean by that is it's like, I'm making huge cash investments in and out all the time. And I know like, Hey, there's, there's money over here. There's money in that house. And I got to, I'm make buying this house. So there's money there. But what ended up happening is our bank account would just fluctuate all the time. And, and I was okay with that as a single bachelor. Um, but as I had a wife and kids, I needed something a little more stable. And that's what got me interested into buying businesses. And um, I bought my first business about six years ago. And what I was really looking for uh, as I purchased, was I was just looking for something constant, something steady, something I could count on every month. And um, I ended up going into the landscaping company business because I knew that there was residual income in that. And it was easy for me to wrap my head around. I, I didn't, you don't need to be brilliant to understand landscaping. And so um, ended up buying, I believe a total of six companies over the last six years and sort of did a, I would call it a miniature M&A, merged them all together. Um, and uh, today own that, that landscaping company. It's called Greenleaf over here in Southwest Florida. And so that's a bit of my story of how I got into real estate. And, you know, today, uh, I don't even know. I think we have like six active flips going on. We've got three or four on the market. I've got somewhere around 40 doors of rental real estate. Um, and so real estate for me is my bread and butter and sort of the business acquisition has been something that it's just, I've been kind of doing on the side. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's important to be able to float to, to what, you know, you feel like you need to do in order to to achieve the the success you're looking for. In your in your bio, it talks about being an emotionally present person, and it's funny because I had a a mastermind dinner last night, and we were doing a little digest this morning uh, with my partner in the, in that organization, and we were saying it's amazing how you know out of the room of a bunch of people, there are some people that are are emotionally present. There are some people that genuinely care when you say something; they want to know about your wife and your family and your kids and what are your hobbies and things. And then there's those that are totally emotionally not present and they only care about themselves. They promote what's good for them. Um, so talk a little bit about that because I, I think you've had great success in that and implementing that into your business. Uh, and what does that mean to you to be emotionally present? 
Yeah, thanks for that question. So um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, this is new to me, Kevin. So about two years ago, I just kind of crashed and burned. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what to do. You know, things were just not good. And I ended up having to go get help. You know, I had to go get a counselor, a therapist, and kind of figure out what was going on with me. And what I realized is I did not have a clue about what was going on inside of me. I didn't have a clue. And one of the reasons was I just was never taught. Um, you know, I, I was taught that kind of like feelings are bad, emotions are bad. And so um, wh what I learned through these like brilliant and capable counselors and therapists was that like these things are actually really good. Um, that feelings are actually clues as to what's going on inside of you. And so, man, I had to do a lot of work just to learn how to even talk about what was going on inside of me. And what I learned was that the more I talked about what was going on inside of me, the more people would be like, yeah, me too, me too. And, and when you're able to like talk and communicate effectively about what's happening inside of you, what, what, what ends up happening is people just are drawn to that. They're very connected to that. So that makes you very attachable and that allows you to then attach to other people. And so just naturally more and more relationships are formed. And the, the other thing I would say it does, Kevin, is it really allows you to be able to genuinely see people and understand them. And, and, and if you're not emotionally capable or you know, you don't have an emotional IQ. What ends up happening is you just end up using people. They get into becoming like pawns in your game to get what you want. But when you have emotional capacity, you, you can kind of stop and pause and actually like see people for who they really are, which is humans with hearts, with feelings, with, with, with families, with things that really matter. And so I'm, I, I, I don't like that I crashed and burned, but I'm actually really glad for it because it opened up my eyes to a world that I had just been missing for 36 years of my life. And part of me is sad because like, I, I wish I could get some of those years back with the emotional health that I have now, but the emotional health I have now makes me a better father. Uh, it makes me a better husband and it makes me just a better leader. And um, I don't honestly, I don't want to do it any other way. I won't, I refuse. I will not do business deals with, with men who don't have themselves who don't understand what's going on inside them. So I'll ask him questions, man. I'll, I'll ask leading questions to see, is this guy an emotional guy or not? If, and if he's not, I don't want to, I don't want to work with him. So that's a little bit of my story about how I got there and why it's so important. And um, sad to say, I just missed it for so long. So. Yeah, I think it's great. So I, I do, like I was telling you before I do some high-end masterminds, I just actually completed a 31 day men's challenge, which a uh, very successful coach over here on the East Coast, does it internationally. Uh, he takes 24 men at a time through a 31-day program about uh, all different things. It's not just fitness, it's fitness, it's business, it's personal, it's professional. Uh, it's, it's digging in deep inside to see what makes you uh, react certain ways and where are ways you can improve. And I think the most important part is that, you know, these 24 men get very, very vulnerable, mm. very, very emotional for, for these you know, 31 days sharing things that they sometimes have never shared with anyone. It could be their upbringing. It could be relationships they're having, you know, toxic relationships that they have nobody to reach out to. So, you know, getting into that emotional state is super important, right? So for people yeah. that are listening, it's like, I'll put even the link below to the, this class that I took. I mean, it was, it was $199 and you get this successful coach for 31 days. Uh, but more importantly, you get to build a brotherhood of men that just care about one thing. And that's about helping each other become more successful, as opposed yeah. to your typical person that cares about them being more successful. It's not yeah. about helping others and sharing that message. Now, I know uh, in your bio, it talks about uh, being a pastor's kid and, and you've done stuff in the ministry uh, mm -hmm. space. How has that shaped part of who you are today? Yeah. Well, part of it was growing up a pastor's kid. I don't know if you know this about pastors, Kevin, but they don't usually have a lot of money. So um, growing up, I, I just was, we were really poor, you know, and my, my parents did the best they could to get by and they worked really hard. But at, at the reality was we were poor. I was the oldest of seven kids. My dad was a pastor. And so I just remember things being tough. And, um, and I think for me, in, in a really good way, that shaped me to, to, to know that I didn't want to do that. You know, I just didn't want to 
not, not be in ministry. I just didn't want to be poor. I didn't want my family to have to suffer. And so um, I kind of like made this deal with God. And my deal was this, like, look, like I'm going to go do things in the ministry for you for the first like four or five years. But can we just work out this deal where like I can at some point leave and then go do business and take care of my family? And that's exactly what I did. You know, right at 18 years old, I was serving as like a youth pastor here locally and ended up being in the ministry like about eight years and um, transitioned over into business and feel like, and I don't know if this is real, maybe just made it up in my head, but feel, feel like God and I honored our deal. Uh, together and uh, feel like the the fruit of um, my business. This is kind of proof that that God like saw me in that and honored that and and so I was just super super glad. But yeah, that that shaped me in a, in a major way, and I'm, I'm glad I was able to do it just like a little different way than what I had growing up. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you sharing that. Uh, you know, I think again, it goes back to your values, right? Your values of who you are and your upbringing and, you know, where you implement things. Like I was a firefighter for six years up in New York. I moved down, um, to Florida 20 days before September 11th. So I was a firefighter right there, like literally 20 days. My life could have changed one way or the other. I I get goosebumps thinking about it. I could have been there, right? I I have pictures of the people I knew down there. Uh, you know, thank God, none of my close friends lost their life there. But I have pictures of them down at ground zero, you know, serving others. And I always think like, so how do we how do we take the lessons that we learned? So the lessons I learned as a firefighter and implement them now into business. And that's one of the things we do very well through the title company is we just continue. It's all about adding value. Like how much value can we add to our clients? People are like, why do you do a podcast? I'm like, because it's educating people. It's adding value. Like if this podcast can change one person's trajectory in life, it was worth taking the hour to record it and and publish it up online because you never know who's listening and what they're going through in life, which is part of why I took that 31 day challenge. Did I need most of it? I already do on a daily basis, you know, owning a, a business for 20 years. You know, a lot of the other people don't, but there are so many things that I don't do. So it's like, I learned, I shared a lot. So a lot of people learned from me and I built some great relationships. So again, it's all about that value. Uh, so owning, being, I own a title company. I own one of the larger title companies here on the East coast of Florida. I speak at all the national RIA. I was actually just on the front page of the, uh, national RIA's, uh, monthly newsletter. So I don't know if you get that, but you'll see me on, on the front page of that. So we get a lot of real estate following. So what would you say if we had to pick like one creative deal that you've done that you can share about maybe something unique about <laughs> it, that, that you did different than, maybe what the competition was trying to do. Yeah. So I did a deal about three years ago and it was, it was right as COVID um, started to to come in and you were kind of hearing about it. And uh, (laughs) I got pitched this deal. I actually got a text message from one of my friends. He said, Hey, you want to want to check this out. So I'd love to take credit for it. It was actually a buddy of mine who hooked me up, but he said, Hey, this agent just listed this riverfront property as a lot, but it's got this huge house. He said he thinks it needs to be torn down. I don't think it does. Basically, tell me what you think. And um, we ended up going in and purchasing a 6,500 square foot house uh, for land value and remodeled it and, and turned it into this most beautiful estate. It was on almost two acres on the river, 6,500 square feet. And uh, Kevin, we ended up making over a million dollars on this house. And I really feel like the the reason we did that was because someone, my buddy, had the creative genius to go like, hey, someone made an error here. Like this guy probably should have listed this as a house and he listed it as a lot. And so that's kind of one thing that I feel like that I'm good at is, is being able to take like things that maybe people just see a little differently. They don't see the value here. They don't see the value here because that's the reality is this, this agent, he just didn't didn't think there was any value in the house and like this that's the literally the drive up i'm like no we're flipping this house i didn't even go inside yet i said we are flipping this house we are not tearing this house down and so be, just being able to see things a little differently has just always been able uh been an asset in my career and so that's that's one little little thing that we've done um that's differently um i'm trying to think of anything else but that's the one that pops off to me 
Yeah, no, it's great. Listen, I mean, you know, the whole idea of this, again, is giving people a different perspective that sometimes you need to look at things through the other side of the crystal, right? Don't always look at it on the way you see it, but look at it from a different perspective. Look at it from not what everyone else is doing. You know, in a lot of our books, we talk, you know, I've authored 10 books now, and, and we talk about all different strategies of how you can do something different than your competition, you know, like I have a lot of friends that are in the title space and, and I'm friends with them and I hang out with them. And it's like, you do what you do well and I do what I do well. And we meet somewhere in the middle. We're not competition. We collaborate and we figure out how to just, you know, make a lot of money together. Uh, so we get a lot of wholesalers. We do tons of wholesale deals. Uh, okay. We've done doubles. We've done triples. We've done quadruples. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, the, the the space of flipping here on the, on the East Coast is is huge with joint venture agreements and, and stuff. So so you've flipped tons of houses, right? Yeah. You run a, a very large flipping business. So what would you say to the investor that is just starting out? That once they get started in the business, because I teach at a lot of these boot camps. So if, if you were sitting in front of a group of, of 35 or 40 new investors, where would they start? Like, what do you tell them to do? Yeah, my advice, Kevin, would be to get your foot in the door however you can. And, and don't get obsessed with like, I need to flip a property myself or I need to go raise money myself. My advice would be just get your foot in a door, whatever that looks like. So if you could get 5% of a deal or 10% of a deal, or if you can just be the GC on the job, like however you can just get your hand in the pot, that sort of like access to the process is going to give you the education that you need to be successful. I actually think it's a terrible mistake to assume that you can go to some, you know, conference or watch some YouTube videos and then just jump in and do it. it it's, you know, anyone can do this, but you do need to have education. Um, I remember a story real quick, Kevin, that someone had lunch with me and they were asking me about a deal. And I said, you should not buy this deal. And, and that was the end of the conversation. It was longer than that. But I remember like six months later, they called me and they said, hey, we're trying to sell that deal on the back end and we can't find any buyers. And I, and I was like, well, guys, like, I could have told you that you're not going to find any buyers. They're not there. It's too high of a price. And so that's like a, an example of how, like, I think they just kind of assumed that they kind of could figure it out and they knew what they were doing. And I, I would just caution against that because I don't want anyone to lose money or get into a situation. Just get your foot in the door. What those people could have done is they could have come to me and said, Hey, how can we help you on a deal that you're doing? Is there anything we can bring to the table? And so that's, that would be my advice. Get your foot in the door, however you can. Yeah, which is great. So when I speak at a lot of these boot camps, you know, these fixing and flipping weekend classes, I tell people like, stop worrying about trying to find the buyer and the seller. Just work on finding the seller and then let someone else help you find the buyer. It's better to split a deal than to get nothing, right? That's so, right. So it's, you know, that, that that's great advice. It's the same advice I tell people like, stop watching these YouTube university classes, like find someone local, partner with them, shadow them, follow them, whatever you can do to just get your foot in the door, yeah. you know, attend a local RIA and start meeting some of the people, speak to the hard money lenders and the contractors and just surround yourself with great people. So yeah. um, thank you very much. So, uh, so you're obviously people can tell you're a great leader, whether it's on stage, you know, preaching to people and, and, and giving them some direction or running a, a very large business. I wrote a book called uh, Operation Leadership. It launched on my birthday, August 29th of last year. I wrote mm -hmm. it uh, all about, because I trained with a U.S. Marine. So I wrote about all about the mindset of training with a U.S. Marine and how that relates into business. Because what I noticed is that the U.S. Marines are, are very focused on, you know, what they do on a daily basis. Like everything is calculated. This one trainer that I, that I train with who owns the gym, he trains uh, NFL athletes, NHL athletes, very big in training, you know, professional athletes on their off time. And, and I noticed that everything is calculated. What he has you do is ca so calculated down to every little move and every weight and every position and how you're standing. So I wrote a whole book about it on leadership because he's such a great leader in the gym. I said, if I can take these 10 or 15 things that you're doing really well mm -hmm. into business, I can teach people how to just become a better leader. So you're clearly a great leader. 
Um, so let's talk leadership for a little bit. What what are some key things for people that are out there that maybe they want to open their own real <laughs> estate company or, or they just want to become a, a better leader in the community? What can they do? So, so first, being the preacher that I am, uh, there's a verse in Proverbs that says this, where, where there is no vision, the people perish. All right. So the first thing a great leader has to have is he's got to have a vision. Like you got to know where you're going. And the reality is, is that uh, people will follow any vision. It doesn't even have to be good. And I can point to historical examples of this. Um, if you have a vision, people will follow you. OK, um, now they may stop following you if you're a bad leader, but it starts with a, with a vision. Um, the second thing I would say is my secret sauce, Kevin, is um, I, I see my people. All right. You know what happens with a lot of leaders is they get the vision. They start running and they just kind of get followers and then the followers just kind of get left in the dust and, and they end up becoming casualties in, in, in sort of the war of this person's this leader's vision. And it's really sad and it's very poor leadership. Um, and, and, and what I think my secret sauce is, is I see and know my people. Like I just see them. I see them when they're tired. I see them when they're upset. I see them when they're sad. I see, I see them when they're doing well and when they're succeeding at their job. I have a high awareness of my people at all times. And then I verbalize that awareness. So I'll say like, Hey man, I see that like you're really tired today. Is everything okay? You know? Hey dude, I saw how you crushed uh, that tile yesterday. The tile looks amazing. Um, dude, I saw how you got four deals last month. Incredible. So I'm constantly acknowledging that the things that I see, whether they're good or whether they're bad. And what I have found is when people feel seen and heard and understood, they will go with you anywhere. It will go with you anywhere because that builds such a high level of trust. Like this man gets me. Like he understands me. Like I'm just not some pawn in his game. Like he really cares about me. And so, man, I, I would say if you're going to be a leader, you got to actually care about people. You got to see them, know them, understand, understand them, and then voice that back to them. Yeah. Awesome. I think one of the best analogies to connect being a good leader as far as having a vision not to say that all leaders are great but when you look at the political landscape you know we don't bring politics in, into the podcast but you know regardless of what side it doesn't matter local politics national politics international politics each side leads their own way and it's leading by connecting leading by having a vision right of where we're going and you want to follow you go to local churches, like we have a really big church here, Church by the Glades, Pastor Dave. It's fantastic, fantastic, fantastic church. You go and it's the energy you get. He has a following. There's there's a group of people that are there consistently. You know, so it's all about just having a vision and in, in whatever aspect. So I think that's great. You know, that's why the people come train at the gym I'm at. That's why our clients come to where we have, because we're constantly doing events and providing a bigger vision. Like you want to be on our team. You know, and that's the one thing that makes a lot of these title companies, you know, such a waste of time is because they'll close deals. Everyone should be able to close deals. Like I always tell people, like, if I don't close your deal and I don't close it really well, shame on me. I wouldn't be in business 20 years. It's what else do we offer that provides a bigger vision, better training, better support. And you're walking with us into the future. You're walking with us into success because we don't want to let you fail. So um, so that's great. I have one more question for you and then I'll let you go because I know you're busy. Uh, let's talk about, we talked about real estate. We talked about obviously being a pastor, being a good leader, emotional. Let's talk about finance a little bit because I know you do a lot with, with businesses and, and you know raising money and connecting people. So let's talk about that a little bit and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk it on two fronts. I'll talk it on the personal and, and then more the professional. The, the personal front, um, you know, my feedback is always stop trying to live like everyone else, you know, um, stop trying to drive the nice car, stop trying to get the bigger house, like just stop. Like we get so caught up in this rat race to, to, to steal from Robert Kiyosaki. We get so caught up in this game. We're trying to like beat our neighbors and, and, and what most people will never see about my story, Kevin, is that for the first really 10 years of my professional life, you would have never known that I had anything. 
I mean, I was driving a $500 Toyota Corolla. Okay. Um, I, I remember uh, buying a house, that house that I actually mentioned and renting out all the rooms while I slept on the couch for two years, I slept on the couch, rented out the rooms. Like I was willing to do anything and everything and really willing to do things other people weren't willing to do. And so you've got to get your money right. And it starts with stop looking at everyone else. Just take care of you and you do what's best for you. And what else I have found that helps is just admit that maybe you don't know uh, what's best for you as it relates to money. I see so many people think that like, I know what's best for me. Well, really, like it's not working. So maybe you don't. And so just pause and go, okay, maybe I do need help. Maybe I do need to like ask a friend that is good with money or hire a financial advisor to peek into my finances and give me really sound advice. So personally, that's that's my passion is I'm very angry about people getting their money right because I I get upset when I see people stress out about it. And it, it is something that you can beat, that you can win at. And it, it's not as hard as you might think, but it, it, it's going to take sacrifices that you might not want to make. That's probably a good way to say it. So that's the kind of personal side. The professional side is um, if you want to raise money, you have to be a man or woman of integrity. That's all that boils down to. Like, do people trust you? And, and that really ties back to your personal uh, spending habits. Like, I, I think people look at the way I handle my personal money and they look and they say, well, if Britt's going to like be this like conservative and careful um, and he's going to live this well below his means, then like, man, I, I'm trust he's going to take if he's going to take care of his money, I'll trust he'll take care of my money. And so I think it's a it's 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 really foolish to, to live like a super lavish lifestyle. Uh, um, and so like, I just live a conservative lifestyle. We have a, I'm sitting in it right now. We have a really nice house. I, I drive a model three Tesla. It's a pretty nice car. Okay. We've got some nice things, but I could have a lot nicer things. And, and but we've chosen like, this is all we need. Like, I don't need anything else. And so I've lived very conservatively. And I think professionally, that's really helped me. People aren't seeing me hop on a private jet and drive a Lamborghini and post all this crap on Instagram. Um, they see a man who like cares that I get their money back to them. And, and because I care and, and because I'm willing to sacrifice, I think these people, the, honestly, what ends up happening is they, they, they want to give me money and I can't take it because I don't have enough opportunity for them. And so for me, raising capital has been a very easy experience. And I think it just boils down to integrity. And I don't say that to, to brag. I just say that I just lived a life, a very simple one. Um, and I've been successful enough in business where I think people just trust me, Kevin. And, and so if you can you have a little track record, have a little integrity, it'll be really easy for you to, to raise capital. And, and for people that are just getting started, and, and if you haven't been around money, you may buy into this lie that like money is hard to get or hard to find. Um, and and that's, that was my mentality, uh, especially as a young entrepreneur. But the longer I've done business, Money is not the problem. Money is actually very easy to find and it's very easy to get. What's hard to find is actual good opportunities to, to place that money. And so I'll say right here, I'll solicit on your podcast. You got an opportunity, call me. <laughs> like I can get the money for it. All right. What I'm starving for is, is, is opportunities. And so I would say free yourself from this mentality that the money is hard to find and there's not enough of it. Um, guys, money is everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, what, where, what there's not enough of is good opportunities to place that money. So overcome that obstacle in your head. It'll be a lot easier to raise capital. That's great. So I have a almost like mirror image story, just like you. You know, when I moved down here, I didn't really have much of anything. I bought a townhouse uh, through my 401k when I was a firefighter. I cashed in my 401k, first time home buyer, tax free bought the townhouse, literally lived in it two days, uh, two years plus one day, cashed out, was able to invest that in, into another property, uh, built a really good business and then went totally broke. That was the one thing I was missing back then was I didn't understand the the finance game. I didn't understand that, you know, as, as a, I was a mortgage broker, real estate agent, title company, like as I was getting these checks, I didn't realize I had to put money away for taxes, like 
there was nobody to teach me that stuff. So I wound up getting three quarters of a million dollars in debt. And I wrote a whole book about how I dug myself out and, and rebuilt my business, got rid of my partners. Um, but then today we look at it and we say, we want to live debt free. We want to live a simple life. We don't want to, you know, like where are we own the office building, where are our, our offices, because we don't want to have to pay someone else's mortgage payment. Um, but we also don't want to have to pay someone else's rent, right? We're just not interested. We want to make sure we're living a very simple life, zero credit card debt, uh, and just live a simple life. Now, yes, again, we live a nice life, but again, very, very simple to the sense of I'm not driving the Lamborghinis and, and the Ferraris and, you know, having a, a $2 million mortgage on my head. Uh, so again, we, we connect on, on that level, which is really, really great. So I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing with our viewers, uh, any last words for them? No, just really enjoyed getting to know you and your story too, Kevin, and, and, and looking forward to, uh, hearing from some of your listeners. Absolutely. So appreciate it. So again, for those of you that are listening, I will put his information below, uh, whether it's on YouTube or on, on, uh, our podcast, you can get all of his information below, but you can see it's a story determination, commitment. He wants to live life on his own terms, financial success and freedom. So again, take what we talked about here today, implement this into your own business, come up with some great values, a great vision in your business, and just do the right thing on your, your daily basis. So thank you so much, Britt, for coming in. I appreciate you uh, hopping on today to share your story. For those of you listening, like, comment, share this post, get some others on here to listen to it. Because you never know, your one share could change someone's life. So thanks for listening. Kevin Thatcher signing off, the owner of Independence Title. I look forward to listening, seeing, talking to all of you. But most importantly, I look forward to seeing you all at the closing table. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.